Welcome to punctuation and grammar video number two. In this video, we're going to combine video two and three. We're first going to look at classifying sentences, and then we're going to move on to comma usage. First of all, let's take a look at some of the topics we covered in video number one. If you are unsure of any of these topics, make sure you go back and review uh, that video. First, we covered the simple sentence, what a sentence is. We looked at sentence fragments. Make sure you understand the difference between a complete sentence and a sentence fragment. Also, we looked at clauses, those building blocks of the sentence. Make sure you understand independent clauses, dependent clauses. Also, we looked at coordinating conjunctions, something we're going to review in this video, and but, or, for, nor, yet, so. And we looked at some common comma errors, which would be comma splices and run-on sentences. So we're going to start this video off with classifying sentences. There are some names of different types of sentences that we've looked at, so this should be pretty simple if we've understood the concepts that's come up to this point. The simple sentence, we already know, that is an independent clause standing on its own as a sentence. So let's look at some examples. We have Cindy smokes catnip. We have the subject of the sentence, Cindy, and what's she doing? There's our verb, she's smoking catnip. Okay, so smokes being our verb here, a simple sentence. Cindy loves cats would be another example, and Cindy is a crazy, stinky cat lady would also be another example of a simple sentence. Compound sentences contain usually two independent clauses. So we're going to join these together, and there are a variety of methods to do so. We've looked at coordinating conjunctions thus far, and pretty soon we'll be looking at semicolons, colons, and conjunctive adverbs. But what I want you to remember about compound sentences is that they are two independent clauses joined somehow. Here's an example. English is an awesome subject, period. That could stand on its own. My instructor is great, period. That could stand on its own. We have a coordinating conjunction with a comma, of course, functioning correctly here. So we have two independent clauses joined together somehow, which means we have a compound sentence. So each clause surrounding the coordinating conjunction can stand on its own as a simple sentence, so we know that this would be a compound sentence. The complex sentence consists of an independent clause and one or more dependent or subordinate clauses. These terms are interchangeable. Ordinarily, we're going to begin the sentence with our dependent clause and we'll end it with our independent clause if we're talking about complex sentences. The reason behind this is because usually our information in the dependent clause is less important and we want to end our sentences or finish them up with the more important information, which would be in our independent clause. So let's take a look at this example. Because my teacher is artistic, he makes learning English fun. We know that this is a dependent clause. We can remove the subordinating conjunction and be left with my teacher is artistic. That works on its own. So the subordinating conjunction is making this dependent. And we know that this can stand on its own. He makes learning English fun. He being my teacher makes learning English fun. So this comma is legal and we have a complex sentence. And here we have a little art just to show you how artistic your teacher is. And let's take a look at another example. When the frog caught the fly, the cyclops snail smiled. Is this a complex sentence? It is. The compound complex sentence mixes the two other sentence types that we just looked at. It has two independent clauses and it'll have usually a dependent clause near the beginning. Let's look at an example. Because Lance's mother was such a good hairstylist, I will enroll into hairdressing school and I will try to emulate her skills. At the beginning here, we have our subordinating conjunction creating a dependent clause, so we know that this comma is okay. When we're looking at sentences that have this many clauses in it, we usually want to break it down. So let's get rid of this first clause in our minds because we've already seen that this comma is correct. Let's look at the what's left over. I will enroll into hairdressing school, comma, and I will try to emulate her skills. Well, we have an independent clause in purple, and we have an independent clause in red. Therefore, we have a correctly functioning coordinating conjunction, and, but, or, for, nor, yet, so. So in the end, this is a correctly functioning compound complex sentence. And here is a great example of my mother's 
great hairstyling skills. Let's move on to the usage of the comma. The comma can be used in many ways in English. We're going to narrow this down and try and simplify the process so that we can avoid making errors. One usage that we've already looked at is with coordinating conjunctions. And, but, or, for, nor, yet, so. We know that coordinating conjunctions join independent clauses. So really we're just looking for independent clauses on either side and inserting the correct coordinating conjunction and of course the comma that comes before it. My psychiatrist thinks that I was dreaming. I think the aliens abducted me. We know those are independent clauses and I've inserted but and but or for nor yet so. My psychiatrist thinks that I was dreaming but I think the aliens abducted me. Yet and and would also work in this situation. So remember that coordinated conjunctions can be interchangeable at times. So go through the list and see which one suits your meaning best. We just reviewed coordinating conjunctions, and we know that they join independent clauses and always have a comma with them. Other uses of the comma are related to fragments. So when we're thinking about commas, I want you to think about fragments unless we're talking about coordinating conjunctions. Commas are generally used to separate fragments that come at the beginning or the end of independent clauses, or even sometimes inside independent clauses. Let's look at some examples of introductory fragments. This is an area that students often struggle with because they leave these commas out. Okay, this first example, although I could be on the beach drinking margaritas, I would rather be sitting in this classroom taking notes about commas. We can see that this first clause in green is a dependent clause, which is a type of fragment as well. It is also followed by an independent clause. So we know this sentence is functioning correctly, and we have an introductory fragment, which is a dependent clause in this case, followed by a comma. So that is correct. If we look at this last example, we have the same thing happening here. Just before bedtime, you need to set your alarm. We have a fragment, not a dependent clause, but that doesn't matter. It's still a fragment. A fragment of any kind introducing our independent clause is going to take a comma. Let's try some exercises. I'd like you to pause the video now and go through these questions and identify the fragments at the beginning of the sentence. Each sentence will require at least one comma. So work on spotting independent clauses and fragments beforehand. You're going to need a comma after each of the fragments. Let's look at the answers. In this first one, we have before you eat as our introductory fragment and you should wash your hands as our independent clause. In the next one, we have in 2014 as the fragment, I went to outer space as our independent clause. The next one we have to be clear as our introductory fragment and I stated that I do not want ketchup in my craft dinner as our independent clause. This next one is a little bit tricky because we have four starters as a short fragment. Then we have if you are going to make fun of me as our dependent clause. Then we have our independent clause of I would rather not talk about my imaginary friend. And in the last one, we have a dependent clause. If you are going to join the chess club, and then we have our independent clause, you better know all the rules of chess. Now we'll add the commas in. After each fragment, you'll notice that there is a comma. Before you eat, you should wash your hands. In 2014, I went to outer space. To be clear, I stated I do not want ketchup in my craft dinner. For starters, if you're going to make fun of me, I would rather not talk about my imaginary friend. So you can see we have two introductory fragments here, which is quite common in English. We can have as many as we want. And at the end, we have, if you are going to join the chess club, comma, you better know all of the rules of chess. Another use of the comma is to denote when we have a fragment within an independent clause. This means that we have a fragment that is less important or it doesn't contain any of the core meaning of the sentence. So in other words, we can remove it without changing the meaning of the sentence. Let's look at this first example. Lethbridge, a city in Alberta, is extremely cold in the winter. A city in Alberta is an aside. 
It's a small statement, a small fragment that is stated in case we didn't know that the city is in Alberta, but it's assumed that you do. So it reads, Lethbridge, a city in Alberta, is extremely cold in the winter. If we pull this out, it doesn't affect the overall meaning or the intended meaning of the sentence. Lethbridge is extremely cold in the winter. The same thing applies for our next example. The elderly gentleman, slowly but surely, made his way through his trapeze routine. Slowly but surely is just here for style, to let us know that he moved through it slow, but we don't need this information to understand the sentence. The elderly gentleman made his way through his trapeze routine. And our last example, we have a single word here, an adverb, used as an aside. Video games, however, are boring compared to studying grammar. So once again, we could remove this. It is just there to denote that the sentence before, we're moving on to something new, and it's a stylistic sort of choice. Another thing that we want to take a look at quickly is that these can be moved around. You'll notice that this one especially, and actually our last one, these can be moved to the beginning of the sentence. Slowly but surely, comma, the elderly gentleman made his way through his trapeze routine. So remember that these fragments can be placed anywhere where they will make sense. If they're in the middle of the clause, we will need two commas to show that it can be pulled out. If it's at the beginning, obviously, we just have that single comma. Let's try some quick exercises to see if you can spot these small fragments within independent clauses. Below I have three simple sentences, and each one of them has some sort of fragment that needs to be offset with commas. So pause the video now and come back when you're done. All right, let's look at the answers. When we're looking for removable fragments, we're looking for short fragments inside the independent clause that can be removed without affecting the core meaning of the sentence. So in this example, we have Slim Jim Capone explained in short what it is like to play Dungeons and Dragons. If we pull out in short, does it matter? Slim Jim Capone explained what it is like to play Dungeons and Dragons. We know that this is just a little aside. We could move it to the beginning if we wanted to with a single comma, but in this case, it's in the middle of the clause, so it is going to need those two commas here. Melvin, for example, watches My Little Pony reruns for hours and hours. So this, for example, once again, could be moved around. It is an aside once again. And our last example... Do not, for the love of puppies, go into the cellar. Okay, for the love of puppies does not need to be in here because really what we're saying is do not go into the cellar. So now we've added our commas, we've already located our fragments, and we're just going to put a comma on either side of each one, denoting that these fragments can be either moved around or pulled out of the sentence completely because they are removable fragments. They are just there for some sort of stylistic reason. Very little core meaning is inside of these fragments. Afterthoughts are another type of fragment we need to look at. And remember, when we're mentioning fragments, we should be thinking about comma usage. Afterthoughts come at the end of the sentence instead of the beginning. It's pretty close to the same rule, but there is a slight variance. Let's look at an example. I still trust the skydiving business, although I think I will pack my own parachute. Hopefully you can see that this is a dependent clause. We have a subordinating conjunction and what could be an independent clause afterward. So we have independent clause followed by dependent clause. This comma is optional. This is the area where you can make the decision, should there be a pause here or not? Typically, if we're talking about a dependent clause coming afterward, there's going to be a comma because dependent clauses are typically quite long. When we have short examples, though, we're usually going to leave the comma out. Most of this will be intuitive for you if you're a native English speaker. You can come along if you want. Most of you probably wouldn't think to put a comma there, and that's perfectly fine. We don't have to have one. If we did put a comma there in this case, it would actually change the meaning of this sentence a little bit. You can come along if you want. It's almost as if we don't want the person to come along if we put the comma in there. So you can see it does change the meaning a little bit. 
I have the example down here switched around to let you know that if it's coming at the beginning, it will always need the comma. If you want, you can come along. Same thing down here. She learned to read in 2005. Hopefully this one even shows you more so that you probably wouldn't even think to put a comma here, and that's perfectly fine. Just remember, if we want to move this to the beginning, we need to have that comma. In 2005, comma, she learned to read. There are a couple conjunctions that sometimes cause problems for students, and they are because and as. I'd like you just to remember that generally speaking, there are exceptions, but you'll probably never have to worry about them. Because or as do not take a comma. You can just write them out. These conjunctions join independent clauses and they need no punctuation. A lot of you probably don't use punctuation with these already and you're on the right track, so just leave it as is. Wear good shoes because the walk is long. I like to wear armor as I prefer to live in the past. Okay, these are perfectly fine with no punctuation. One other area that you probably remember from high school is using commas with lists. This one is pretty easy to grasp, so most of you probably already know it. With lists, we usually introduce the list with an independent clause, and then we have items that we list afterwards, and we separate those items with commas. I like to collect abandoned taxidermy because the animals smell weird, scare away burglars, become my friends, and make my neighbors look at me quizzically when I let them outside for fresh air. So you can see we are listing why we like to collect this taxidermy and the reasons have commas in between. This last one in pink here, that one is optional. Okay, Before this conjunction, a lot of people leave it out. If you want to leave that out, it's perfectly fine. It is correct to leave it in as well. And as, an, as a side note, we're going to be looking at parallelism later on. You can see that I'm starting each list item the same way, in this case, with an active verb. We'll talk about that later. The last usage of the comma that we're going to look at in this video is adjectives in a series. When multiple adjectives modify a noun, we're going to need commas to separate the adjectives. So essentially, if we want to say a bunch of things about a noun, we're going to have to separate them to let the reader know that these are each referring to the noun. So in this case, we have the fat, happy, silly, gopher could not fit into his hole. Each adjective separated with a comma so that we know these connections are happening. Generally speaking, we don't want to write with a bunch of adjectives like this. It's sloppy writing. There is one exception to this rule. When a noun bonds itself with an adjective, it'll create sort of a two-word noun, if you will. Let's look at an example to clarify this concept. Down here we have a cool English professor. We're not really saying a cool and English professor. Cool is modifying both of these words. So English professor is a single title in this case, so we wouldn't have a comma here. Same thing down here with a shiny sports watch. We're not saying it's shiny and sports. We're saying it's a sports watch that is shiny. So shiny is modifying both of these, therefore we don't need a comma there. You don't need to remember this so much for your quizzes, just make sure you don't make the mistake of putting commas where they're not needed. That wraps up punctuation video number two. If you're having any problems with any of the concepts in this video, please be sure to re-watch the video and go through the exercises again.